I got it. I got it. Sorry. I got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're at our um, first committee, um, and that would be the climate committee. And Shaul, who was helping out here, just uh, was uh, speaking. And you can see his information, and um, you can contact him if you have any ideas about climate action or any questions about what the committee might do or is doing. And the next committee is um, conservation committee, and I'm ch chair of that one, and there's my information below. Um, um, we have lots of different projects that we're watching and um, worrying about. Um, you can, and I have an alert there because on November 16th, next Tuesday at 1.30 at the city of Marietta, Marietta Hills housing development hearing is gonna happen. And um, you can talk to me about how you might participate. I'd love to have, you know, people go and make their, give their opinion. You might, it might be interesting for you to just attend and see what they have planned. I have the maps. And if you go to the city of Marietta website to planning, you can find the whole um, EIR and look at the whole extent of it. Um, next. on um, here's the little baby. Oh, I threw this in here and it came out a little funny looking, but um, there's a baby mountain lion that is in our area right now. It's only 13 months old, right? It was, and it was uh, released last June and um, hey, it's called F291. Pam, yeah? the slide that we're seeing is yeah. the butterfly slide. Oh, well, that's too bad. Okay, well, I'll just keep telling you about this, this mountain lion then. Um, so I guess the last couple slides didn't get in. Um, so this little mountain lion, F291, that's wandering around Murrieta and Temecula and up in the plateau, it actually crossed I-15 at Warm Springs and came back again. And the, the scientists are trying to figure out how it got over I-15 or under I-15. They found a few culverts, but she went over uh, to the east side and uh, decided she didn't like all the houses, I guess, and industrial buildings and went back again and is back as far as they know over here on over on the west side again. So let's keep our fingers crossed about this little mountain lion. It's just, uh, it was released because it was orphaned um, when its mom was killed up in Irvine. And so it was released in June here. So poor little thing, hopefully it ho finds a home. <laughs> okay, I'm now on the slide where um, we're talking about we are for butterflies. And that's our not Sierra Club activity, but it's a project by one of our members, Gordon Pratt. And um, there's a forest yeah. restoration project that he's leading. And um, all of us are, have been helping with getting rid of invasive species um, and collecting seeds. Our next, probably our next trip will be in the next month or so to distribute um, some seeds up in the area that we've um, pulled out all the invasives. And then next, where? Okay, all right, this, and that's, that would be um, another non-Sierra Club activity, but um, our member Karen Hansen is um, leading a group, a native plant team um, to put in native plants and work with cities all over Temecula and hopefully Marietta, I mean, Menifee too, well, maybe other cities too. So get a hold of Karen if you'd like to help with that project. There's her contact information. Okay, um um, we're waiting from we're waiting uh, from a response from Jeff. Uh, the city of Temecula is waiting for him, and I'm waiting for him um, because he's going to give us an outline of uh, a, design, a landscape design, and we're just waiting for it. And I'm I'm expecting that yeah. Monday, which which you sent me, Pam, was very helpful. Thank you. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Next. So that's. Gets We're at the, hopefully kind of coming together. Good. And then Margaret um, leads the um, Education Outreach Committee, and there's her information if you'd like to work with her on any kind of education um, type of issue. Um, you don't have this next slide then that I have. Next, um, 
before I talk about the hiking committee, I just want to mention that with the um, education and outreach committee, I work with Margaret too, and we, I have an intern program and we just were awarded um, $600 to do to help with the intern program from the Sierra Club grassroots um, climate climate emergency mobilization team. I think that's what it's called. So oh, oh. Um, we have $600 more. So yeah, so Good we'll get job, a couple of interns out of that. Yeah, I was happy about that. I'd actually forgotten I applied for it. So I was confused on how come they were giving me the money till <laughs> I talked to somebody. <laughs> okay, then um, hiking committee. And that's Bob Otterbert, and you can see his information. And he's working hard to get the hiking program back going because um, because of COVID. COVID and Sierra Club has to be very careful. Um, it still is not in, rolling along, but he does have scouting hikes that he does just as um, you know non Sierra Club scouting scouting hikes, and uh, so you can contact him about those. And then next, so. Um, do you see the, the two types of hikes that you can go on other than the Sierra Club ones? Is that screen showing to you? Yes. You? The Volkswagen. Yeah. Volkswagen yeah. and Good. Santa Margarita. Okay, yeah, so those are two other opportunities if you like to, to hike. Uh, the Volkswagen is a lot of fun. It's a meetup group, but it's probably easiest to get a hold of Kathy. You can see Boons and Cots seven at gmail or you can go to the meetup group um and she does some real fun walks all over the place that you usually a six mile or a three mile and those are a whole lot of fun and then the santa Margarita ecological reserve um hikes are great because you know it is at the ecological reserve so beth cobb is the contact you can see on the bottom smur docent hikes at gmail.com Okay, so let's see more committees. Uh, next political committee. And we're looking for somebody that likes to work with poli in politics because we like to endorse local candidates and try to get involved in uh, promoting the, the right kind of people to represent us. So anybody interested in that committee, we're waiting and willing to have you step in. Um, next. Then the Trails Committee, uh, Gary Otte is the chair. You can see him and um, our 16 mile trail project has been uh, in place since 2014 about. And um, we still have our four city planning team meet uh, triannually and still getting that trail connected, but um, it's really moving along. The Temecula section should be open in just a few months. And then, Next, um, now for our presentation. So um, we're gonna have Annie Peralta share the screen after Bruce unshares, but she's uh, from Ensenada, California, <laughs> Baja, California. And um, she's, she runs the Fauna de Noreste. She's the founder um, and she's been helping local agencies try to repopulate the red-legged frog in our region. So it's really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting topic and animal. So um, hopefully we can get Annie to share, Bruce to stop sharing and Annie to start. And we'll have questions um, at the end. Put your questions in the chat if you like. Okay, Annie? Okay. Sorry, <laughs> trying to unmute myself. <laughs> Hi, Ooh, well, this is pretty. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here and talk to you about red legged frogs. Um, as you know, this is, uh, I'm the one speaking now, but this, is, uh, this work is done by a lot of people. And we did a, a working group uh, for Baja California, Red Legged Frog, and that's our logo. And everybody's welcome to join if you like Red Legged Frogs or want to help. So to wake you up, because I know it's kind of late, I did wanted to start with a question of what is charisma? And it relates back to the question um, somebody asked me about why amphibians. Um, oh, well, charisma, 
is defined as something that is, has compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire devotion in others. And of course, when you see charismatic species, I mean, I just want to hold that uh, bear and the giraffe and even that uh, lovely um, cat right there, a uh, jaguar, because they're so cute that you want to protect them and you want to I mean, avoid having them extinct because they're so pretty. But the organization I work on, we don't focus on this kind of species. We focus on the other kind, the ones that maybe are not that charismatic because you don't want to, maybe your first impression is not to hold them and touch them because, you know, they're, they're not, not like a, a panda bear. Their, their skin is kind of rock like lizards or slimy like amphibians or rodents. I mean, probably not a lot of people like rodents or the house, but these species are really important. You know, they are important for the ecosystem. And we, if we lose any of the of this, um, we will break it and definitely things uh, start going wrong. So today we're going to be talking about amphibians. I know you are our expert, but um, yes, as more information so you can remember, amphibians are the vertebrate group that is more in danger. And uh, four out of 10 species are disappearing. And I just love this poster by Save the Frogs because it shows the threats that amphi amphibians are facing. And you can see we have um, habitat destruction, pollution, disease, pet trade, climate change, and exotic species. And that's the threats that amphibians are facing all over the world. Right. Today, we're going to be talking about red-legged frogs. The California red-legged frog is the largest native um, frog in Western North America. There's, of course, bullfrogs, but that one is introduced. And, you, and it's known as red-legged frog because of the coloration of their um, hind lips. How you can see, they, they have, they're, some of the frogs are really bright red. Actually, this, the first photo is from a frog in California the ones in the right from Baja California. So here, they're not that red, but you know, they're, we still, they still have that kind of reddish coloration. They're pretty big, I guess, if you wanna compare to something familiar, kind of like a hamburger. So it's big and, 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 it's, and heavy as a hamburger. And because of its size, it can eat other local amphibians like the Pacific tree frog or even a small rodents like little baby bulls that are more near to wetlands habitat. So the story begins back in the 1800s where the species was distributed along all along the coast of California and Baja California. That would be the green color right here. But then um, we start, you know, people find out that their legs were really tasty. So they start eating them just like Grogu here in the picture. And if you have seen Star Wars, and they start declining, I mean, because of that over harvest. And to supplement that decline, they bring bullfrogs because those uh, legs were larger and maybe had more meat. And that's where we introduce, of course, more exotic species to the equation. And then, of course, we want to big houses and malls. So we start destroying their habitats. So right now, um, only the the black area is their actual distribution. And as you can see, they, uh, we lost most of the populations in the Sierra and then south of Los Angeles, all the way through Baja California, where we only have a few remaining populations. And you can say, well, maybe, you know, it's not that bad because we still have a lot in the coast. You guys have really like frogs nearby. But then we found that um, through genetics that there's actually two different lineages that you know, people can argue that there's actually two different species, but taxonomists haven't find the time to write the paper and <laughs> describe the species. But we always talk about there's a United States lineage and a Mexican lineage. And the break is about um, south of Los Angeles, in this area right here. And what will that mean is that the Mexican lineage got extinct in the US and it's only found now in Mexico. And that, that has conservation issues because then if you wanna reintroduce them here, you cannot reintroduce them from another species. You have to do it from the species that was there. 
And, and that's why we come here into this project. So in, in Mexico, in Baja California, they lost about 85% of their distribution. This is a close-up of the localities where we still found red-legged frogs. They are only in three watersheds, and every dot here represents a historical or recent um, observation. Red dots indicate historical sites where the species is no longer found. This means that even in the places where they are located, they are not doing fine. They are not like everywhere. And when we start doing surveys, we will find from five to 10 frogs at each of these sites. And if you work with red legged frogs in California, you usually find between 20 or 50 or even 100. So these low numbers well, says that the populations were really not doing great and that they needed help. Also, talking about genetics, we wanted to know how bad genetically these remnant populations in Baja California were doing compared to your populations in, in California. To the ones that are isolated, like in the Sierra Nevada or Southern California, and we found that the ones in Baja were like half, has half of the genetic diversity that the ones you have in the United States. And why? Genetic diversity is important. Well, it is, it's, it's again like, um, and if the more eye colors you have, if we have a disease that kills red colors and, and frogs, you're still gonna have yellow and blue and orange color frogs. But if you only have two colors um, in your population, if somebody, if a disease comes and kills one of them, then your half of your population dies. So it's really important to have genetic diversity to be able to survive through diseases and other kind of um, threats in the area. And we know Baja California populations do not have a lot of genetic diversity. So that's something we also need to work on. And why they disappear in Baja? Well, same thing as in the US, even though we didn't eat them, we do have a lot of exotic species and 68% are invasive meaning that the impact that they have in the ecosystem is, is a lot. And even though red-legged frogs are, you can consider big and they can maybe defend themselves, these red-legged frogs really likes the habitat really pristine and they don't like to coexist with exotic species. So they are the first one to disappear, unlike other smaller native species that will survive with exotics. Sadly, we also uh, lost um, the habitat of the highest known site for red-legged frogs. This is La Encantada. This is a mountain meadow in the Sierra San Pedro Martir National Park, about 7,000 feet in elevation. And this is a historical site for red-legged frogs. There's records for 1925, uh, over a hundred specimens in museums. And now it's just something, it's a dry wetland. There's a lot of cattle, a lot of uh, livestock in this area, or used to be, and there's no more related frogs in here. So what we, we find out, well, we know in the United States, the Mexican lineage is extinct. The last known population uh, was known from 2002 from Santa Rosa Plateau. And in Mexico, well, we know we st they're still here, but there are only four population remain at only 10 sites in really low numbers and really low genetic diversity. So we had a lot of things to, to work on. So what are the things that we are doing to help the species? Well, in Mexico, we start by doing habitat enhancement. Why? Because we know there were so many few frogs. Why there were few frogs? Because they didn't have any, any breeding habitat. Uh, we took them away by grabbing, by having too, um, too much water extraction or grazing. So we created this habitat. And this is something you guys have been doing in California. So we didn't like invent anything. We just took uh, your methods that has been successful and bring them in Mexico through collaboration. Of course, we were not expert or have never built ponds in Mexico, but you guys have. So we start at a pilot cycle, Ranch Melling, and we start building ponds. We got our first grant um, for organization was for National Geographic to be able to build this 
pond. At first, it feels kind of weird because you feel like you're destroying the habitat. But at the same time, um, you, you can restore it and you can see the life and the benefits that this brings. So we were able to build two ponds and restore a third one, about 200 um, square um, meters, one next to the other one. This was in 2018. And this these ponds are right next to the stream where they are red-legged frogs about 100 meters away. And we didn't reintroduce them. We let the frogs find their, find their, their ponds by the, their own. We also restore some of the ponds that were already in the ranch, but they're not being used by the frog because you can see it's full of tule and it was all muddy and there was Maybe juveniles were used it, but there was definitely no habitat for laying eggs. So it's like having, you know, you you have you don't have a house to have a baby. You just wander around, and you you wouldn't be able to to have babies in in, in this place. The the other thing that we did, we know we want to protect it, so we we put some uh, fencing, wildlife friendly fencing, to keep cattle away. We didn't fence the whole pond. We leave some areas for cattle to drink water or drink the cattails around. And, but we find out that this is a picture from, from last month that aquatic vegetation likes to go back and there's tons of cattails that grows into our ponds. So every, every year we have to go there and take it out so it won't overgrow and dry the pond. So actually every year we have to bring up a, a whole bunch of volunteers. You're welcome to come. And it's a hard work. We do it by hand. And we just finished our, our trip um, two days ago. And it takes about, uh, it took us about seven days and 13 volunteers to clean the ponds and leave it like this. And even though you might say, oh, you take too many. I mean, cut, uh, we did that every year and every year Tule comes back. And we leave a little bit of tule because frogs likes to lay eggs on them, but it will regrow by, by the time uh, frogs uh, lay their eggs and they just love it. Uh, but it's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's totally worth it. So then of course we have to monitor if those ponds are being used by frogs, if they're laying eggs. And at some of the places where we know that frogs, we try to monitor to figure out if population is stable or what's happening with them. So we monitor egg masses from uh, January to March. And you know we do all the basic biology things that we measure and see where they are, how deep and how big, and where are they laying the egg masses. Egg masses is about the size of a watermelon and it has from a thousand to 2000 eggs in there. And what we saw, I mean, it, it's amazing. These this ponds were built in 2018. Frogs arrived the next year, but they didn't reproduce until 2020. And in the first graph, you can see the number of egg masses that were laid in the ponds that we built or restored, which were 13. And this year they went up to 23. So it was amazing because you can see there was the, it should be a zero here. It went from zero to 13 to 23. And it's, uh, there are frogs everywhere now. And this is the numbers of eggs, um, number of eggs laid in other ponds. There's one or two other tiny little ponds in the area or in the stream. And we, we saw this, the, the effect that building these ponds creates to, to protect egg masses. At a different place where we haven't been able to build ponds, eggs are laid in the stream, of course. But we saw that with heavy rains, most of the egg masses got washed away. So we don't have a lot of recruitment in those sites. So we really need to push to keep building these ponds so eggs can be secure and can survive uh, through the season. This is also a graph from the same site from the number of frogs that we found, adult frogs. And you can see in 2019, we found around 20. Next year, we went up to 30. But this year, when we're doing surveys, like we just keep finding and finding frogs, up to 74 frogs. It was just crazy. We're like, I'm done. I'm too tired. <laughs> There's so many frogs. But it's just amazing how in three years, we were able to recover that population. And I just love this project because it shows that 
I mean, uh, we can we can restore um, the habitat. And this is a comparison with other populations. We we only been able to survey four of the ten sites where we know there's relegate frogs. And you can see Melling Ranch is the one where we build the ponds. And I mean, it's, it's just amazing the difference um, in numbers of frogs are at, at each of those sites. Um, we just built this year a pond in San Rafael. So hopefully in two years, we can see the recovery. Uh, we built tiny ponds in El Potrero, but it seems like they're not gonna be working. We need one of those big ponds. So that's our next goal is to raise money to build ponds in El Potrero. And La Grulla, well, this is a high elevation meadow. This is gonna be a hard one, but of course it also needs some, some help. But I just love that this project shows that, you know, nature will, will go back as long as we give them a push and we help them. And it doesn't take that much. Of course, other things that we are doing is we don't love it, but we have to get rid of uh, bullfrog. It's an exotic species. If we want to reintroduce relegate frogs into their historical sites, we need to get rid of them. So there's bullfrogs in many historical sites for relegate frogs in many streams, along with other species. And we are working on a buffer eradication plan in, in the area. But what about United States? Well, you guys have had a lot of time to restore habitat and do uh, conservation easements, which I know takes a lot of time and a lot of permits. And then you came here and told us that you wanted to do some reintroduction. So as I show you, we have that one place, only one that it has a lot of egg masses. So we give it a try again. Remember that we have two lineage, the United States and the Mexico. So the goal was to reintroduce uh, egg masses from Mexico to two sites into Southern California. One is the Santa Rosa Plateau and the other one is a private ranch in San Diego. And at, at the private ranch, they, they restored and built a huge pond and Santa Rosa Plateau when it was the last known historical place for relegate frogs. So the way it's done is that you translocate half of an egg mass. Of course, you don't wanna take the whole egg mass because you're gonna take the gen all the whole genetic diversity. And you need to find out how many egg masses you have because you cannot take them all. We only take 10% of the egg masses we found in the area. So if at Mellings we found um, 20 egg masses, we only take uh, two egg masses. So. We take half and put it in this plastic container in that uh, mash, and then we put it on a really good uh, uh, cooler, uh, regulate with temperature regulated and with air, and then we fly them to a place uh, near the border. The plan was to fly them all the way to California, but it was right about before COVID, I think like two weeks before, so it just <laughs> got impossible to do it. Uh, but we fly them near the border and then they got driven there. And everything happened the same day, of course. They, from the time of collection to the time where they release, it's between uh, six, I don't know, it's a little video, I don't know if it's gonna show. Sorry. It's just a little video. Sorry, okay, okay. Yeah, so here you can see people from USGS, the San Diego Natural History Museum, and the Nature Conservancy. Before COVID, nobody's wearing masks. I think it's like one week before uh, it was declared. And they're bringing the ice chest and to the two sites in Southern California. And I just love this picture because it just shows the happiness of, you know, having back a species that they haven't seen in, in over 20 years. And uh, it just, you know, it talks by its own. And this is their place in, in this uh, pond, in this, in this um, pens, I guess that's how they call it, where they put the egg masses and they're gonna check, they're being checked every one or two days to make sure there's no mortality or no predators coming in. And once they reach a certain size, they're being re they got released to the environment. It's a little video, those little frogs being released. 
There they go. Little frogs from Baja California doing the American dream in California. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Yes. All right. So is this been two years of reintroduction in 2020? We were only able to translocate three half egg masses and about 400 tuples were released. It was the first year we didn't, we were working out the methods and everything. But in this year, we were able to translocate six half egg masses because we have way more egg masses at, at Melling's Ranch and over 4,000 tadpoles were released. We have a really high uh, success this year. Last year, we did have mortality, but this year we totally rock. We have everything work out perfectly. And in December last year, it was the first time that juveniles of related frogs were seen in Southern California. So uh, it's great. So far it's been doing great. There, there's definitely gonna need be a need for more translocations is there, since it's only a few egg masses and in the wild success rate is about 3%. Of course, we try to increase that success rate by keeping them in pens and keep them safe, but there's gonna be mortality anyway. But yeah, so far it's been, it's been great. And uh, what's coming on? Well, we have, as, as I showed you, there's tons of fun building and maintenance that we need to do. In Mexico, there's still at least six other sites that needs these actions. We need to continue doing uh, population monitoring and start looking for funding to monitor the other places where we haven't been in over 10 years. And of course, continue bullfrog eradication if we wanna um, and restore historical sites. We are looking into places to reintroduce them in Mexico. And of course, uh, reintroductions in California. There's gonna be at least one more year of reintroductions into California, but also the people in California are already looking for other places where they can be reintroduced, either from Baja or from the ones that they already are, are were, were there, they were released. And again, this is a lot of people, a lot of collaboration, this is the, the people at the Baja California Working Group from uh, people from USGS, US Fish and Wildlife, the San Diego Natural History Museum, the Nature Conservancy, the Wildlife Project, the Sonoma Mountain Rush Preservation Foundation, and, and several other institutions and funding in, uh, agencies. Uh, again, everybody is welcome if, if you wanna help um, red-legged frogs. And how can you help? I know you all are planet and not plastic, but I just have to mention it because, you know, I don't have to say much about it. <laughs> just pick planet, please. And also if, if you will consider becoming a monthly donor or one-time donation for a nonprofit, we will really much appreciate it. We do collaborate with the International Community Foundation, so they will give a tax deduction for your um, contribution. We just have a, a, a girl that donates $8 a month and, and we just love it. It's not only about the amount, it's, it's about the fact that um, you, you believe in what we do and, and you know, we, we can do more even uh, with tiny little support. And I'll, I'll assure you that we're gonna do as much as possible to, to use that funding. And I think that's, that's it, that's my email if you wanna, Contact me, my Instagram. I don't post much, but I'm, I'm trying to be better. And this is our website, Fauna del Noroeste. It's in Spanish and English. You just need to pick the language. And yeah, we'll be happy to, to collaborate and just help in any way I can or learn from you guys since you have tons of projects going on. And I bet you, you might have some ideas on, on how to do things uh, differently. But thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Annie. We have we do have a few questions in the chat. I think uh, Pam's been posting some. Can everyone see those, or is it just me that can see them? I can read it out loud if no one else can see it. So, Annie, oh, it's funny you went to the. So I put it in the wrong slot, huh? Somehow there's a a waiting room spot. <laughs> That's funny. So Pam, do you want me to read the question? 
Or, yeah, or I can just do it. Um, yeah, I just recently finished a book called Eager. Um, it's all about beavers. And so have you ever have you ever seen beavers in Baja because they're supposed to be the, the best engineers to fix any kind of habitat, aquatic habitat? Yeah, we don't have in the area that we work. I think the only place in Baja where there's beaver is in the Colorado Delta River um, near Mexicali. Oh. In that area, they do oh. have beavers there, but not us. Yeah, it would be great to have them. Okay. And then, um, how do you protect the frogs when you're taking all that cattail out? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, we decide to take the cattail um, where we make the less impact, of course. I mean, going there and taking everything. So there, we are sure that there are no egg masses in the area. Egg masses are laid from January to uh, March, maybe April. And then um, frogs uh, metamorphs in July or August. So right now we only have juveniles and they, you know, they can go away. So that's why we only do cattails from um, October and November. That's the only time we can do it. So we, we do it once a year. So we don't um, affect the habitat, disturb the habitat. Um, yeah, that much. <laughs> and then my, my last question, probably won't be my last, but because <laughs> I always have too many questions, but last one I wrote down was, um, so you had four total sites. So I saw La Grulla and um, a couple other ones. Are they nearby Rancho Mailing or are they somewhere else in Baja? They're in different watersheds. And um, there is one that is close to, to Rancho Mailing, which is El Potrero. But again, it's a different watershed. So each of these sites comes um, in a different watershed. They're about um, three hours away from each other. Oh, okay. Okay. Anybody else have a question? I do. Annie, this is Elliot Handrus. Hey. I met with you a few years ago when I was the director of the Species Restoration Project. I don't know if you remember with USGS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yes. but anyway, uh, I was wondering what methods you're using for bullfrog eradication and are crayfish a problem down in Baja as well? Because we were trying to, as you know, restore habitat in the Temecula area for red-legged frog reintroduction and bullfrogs and crayfish were a big, big problem. Yeah, well, we haven't started with crayfish. We only do um, capture to reduce population, but having like really going into crayfish for bullfrogs, we we hunt them with air, air guns. Yeah. 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 And yeah, we we did have a pilot place near. Again, we love pilots. That is right <laughs> to learn. And we were able to get them all. And uh, it was a small population, like about six months. And we have, we've been monitoring a year, over a year now, and they haven't come back. Now we are doing it in La Mission, which is a bigger area and more frogs in there, but we have seen the decline in adults and then we have little juveniles and then the ones that been metamorphing, you know, that's the one you, you hit. It takes about two years, but. Yeah. Did, the did they do it at Santa Rosa Plateau as well? Uh, yeah, I think they did it a long time ago. Uh, there, I, I don't think there's any bullfrogs nearby, oh. or maybe upstream, I think, but far away from the ponds where they're being um, reintroduced. Cool. Great to see the progress you've made. Yeah. Really, really, really amazing. That's all I got. So, um, yeah, so so if we wanted to donate to the project, is it good to go to ICF first if we want it tax deductible, or do we go to Fauna del Noreste? Oh, you got, you got to, put the, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you go to Fauna del Noroeste and there, it says a little link that says donate. It will it will, it will give send you to I, I mean it's through ICF, it's the same. Okay. Um Another question was, um, where do you find your staff and do you have um, like continual help from say USGS and um, other places 
or do you just have to find your own staff or helpers? Yeah, we have a, we are four people right now, um, you know, find funding from <laughs> places that, that we can. Uh, USGS was going to help us, but due to pandemic, they cannot cross the border. So we've been, um, we have to take that responsibility. The museum also comes, but the same situation, not always. So, but TNC has been great. They've been able to fund um, the, the pay for those uh, staff for this program and also trying to help us not only fund like the reintroduction, but trying to do a little bit more, of course. I love it because it is like, I know it kind of feels like it's only for the US sometimes, but they also want to help out. And we are learning uh, methods and everything to reintroduce them in Mexico. So it is a truly collaboration. Oh, yeah. Wow, it sounds like a great program, great program. And so, um, I mean, the overgrazing and the, um, you know, the destruction of habitat is always a problem. How do you get people to, you know, stop, you know, or help you as far as the farmers and, you know, the, the government and stuff to save some areas? How do you do that? Well, yeah, it's, it's not easy. Um, all the places that we, we are worried, they're private. So I guess this it's government is not in the, in the issue, in the, in the equation right now. I, it's, sometimes it's easier or harder to work with, um, with owners, but that's why in some of the places we do fence the pond, not completely, but to allow also grazing you know, to go into the area. And sometimes they will break into the, the fence, but it's fine. They will help us eat the cattail sometimes, but um, so far it's been okay. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is a fight with grazing and how to, how to work it out. I am still learning that. Yeah, yeah, wow. Well, I, I think that's the top. Oh, I see Anna has her hand up. Anna Weimer. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. But uh, I just have uh, one question. Um, what is the status of the reintroduction of the red-legged frogs in the Santa Rosa Plateau? Santa Rosa. Well, the first year uh, we only were able to release, I think up to, I think it was just like 10 tadpoles. We did have some mortality in Santa Rosa. However, we just, well, we, well, USDS people uh, found one of those um, translocated, one of those 10 tadpoles um, survived and made it to a juvenile. So it was, it was, it was great to see that survival rate. And from this year translocation, they're still doing surveys. I think they have found only like 20 um, metamorphs right now, but I mean, they're still in the process of doing the surveys. So does that mean that uh, you will continue next year with more reintroductions? The plan is to do at least one more year and then evaluate the results, how everything is going. And uh, we have put more egg masses in the private lunch than Santa Rosa because the habitat seems to be, used to be um, larger. But again, we're gonna be evaluating that uh, after next year translocation. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Annie. No, thank you um, for inviting me. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm already trying to think of how I could get down, get get, get down there. So um, <laughs> that would be fun. I wouldn't mind wandering around in those cattails. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks to everybody that uh, came, and um, thank you so much, Annie. Yep, and hopefully, we'll you. your program will be even more successful next year, huh? Yeah, we'll see. And yeah, building more ponds and hoping the other populations will recover. And just show that, you know, repeat this with other species. There's so many binational species that need our help. And so we just want to prove that we can do it. We just need to make it happen. That's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Pam.
Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. Night.